This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Sudden, cruel, and unusual deaths oftentimes lead to hauntings. I think that's a fair statement to make. We hear about that quite frequently when someone is killed in an instant, or there being confusion of a spirit wandering, a spirit seeking answers as to what is actually going on with them. Why are they in this state, and why are we in ours? When you mix cruel, unusual, and human negativity with that, I think you have another recipe for extreme confusion and even an angry spirit at times. In our next story, we hear about a young man who is carefree, promiscuous, and very much a wild soul. One who goes around, does their thing without much care or concern for others, finds himself mixed up with a wrong crowd, and eventually that crowd, in their own negative intent and selfish desire, take his life for what he has. Leaving a young man on the other side searching for answers reaching out to his living friends for some direction as to what is going on and how to get to the next spot. Take a listen. This happened with my ex-boyfriend. We were both 16 years old, and this was the first encounter we had together, and the most vivid, frightening experience of my life. We had a mutual friend a few years older than us. We'll call him Adam. He was 19 and infamous in our town for living a very promiscuous lifestyle where he constantly looked for sex, alcohol, drugs, and parties. His family was extremely rich, Catholics, and many times as we were growing up, Adam had thrown his parents into turmoil over their reputation by sleeping with prostitutes. On a school rugby tour, crashing important school functions, blind, drunk, and humiliating the headmaster, teachers, and governors. Needless to say, Adam didn't last long in education and embarked upon an alcohol-lubricated gap year while planning to attend a college his parents had paid for him to get into in an attempt to help him do something with his life. In the space of this year, he seemed to get in with a bad drug crowd, and as he grew more and more alienated from his family, he'd often not return home at night and end up sleeping on a bench in the center of town or be found unconscious in a park in the early morning hours by the police. Fran and I never really knew why Adam liked us all this time, as he mostly enjoyed beating up the younger boys and hitting on girls who didn't know better. But for the most part, Adam left us well alone and obviously approved of our relationship, even stopping by at school occasionally after he had left to chat with us about what he was doing over the fence. What always astonished me about his exploits was that he was hardly ever held accountable for them. He would think it was funny that he was off his face in the middle of nowhere, that he had slept with somebody's wife without her husband finding out, or that he only got a caution from the police when they caught him breaking into some gallery or other place early hours of the morning. To him, it was just what a young lad would do, and I don't think he ever perceived it to be behavior that was harmful to others. One morning, as I was on a school bus, a group after group of pupil getting on with wide eyes, talking very excitedly about something that had happened yesterday afternoon. 
News spread to the back of the bus and my friends and I were sitting that Adam had been arguing over drugs with local tramps in a field a few miles outside of the city and the tramps were so desperate for them they, for less of a better word, had decapitated Adam. No, how can that possibly be true? was their first reaction. Excited and scared at the same time. But as the day progressed, we learned the sad news in the school assembly. That one person had knocked Adam unconscious already in an inebriated state and attempted to steal his drugs and his money. As Adam had come around, every so often he had started to fight him off and was proving too strong to control despite drifting in and out of consciousness. Once they had seen how much money Adam was carrying and how lucrative it might be to steal his possessions and clothes, five other people joined in. And with a knife, one of them was carrying, held him down and slit his throat and killed him. Despite it not being relevant whether Adam was decapitated or not, it seems he eventually was. As they became more and more psychotic about what they had done and continued to torture the body until his head eventually came off. While the police originally thought that was the cause of death, they later found out it was a cut to the throat. The school and local community were immediately encompassed with what I can only describe as chaotic hysteria. Some were saying he had it coming. Others were crying for the poor boy, and his parents were utterly broken. Fran and I, being neither Catholic nor so close to Adam that we were broken too, watched it all with a very quiet religious inquisitiveness and a deep sense of sadness. Two nights later, Fran and I were lying in each other's arms in his bedroom talking about what had happened and the spell the local community seemed to be under. No sooner had we walked about it for more than five minutes, we felt someone come into the atmosphere. Something was downstairs. We sat up. I was half closed and immediately tried to cover myself up as it was becoming freezing in my room but couldn't move. We thought for a second it was Fran's parents returning home, or worse, a burglar, and we'd have to get a weapon to fight them off. The most primeval part of my being was raising its hackles in a way that seemed totally unnatural to my surroundings. I was utterly terrified to my core. It was a strange feeling because my body was reacting to a perceived threat while my mind was still babbling on and rationalizing it talking in a very mature way to Fran about the feeling we were both having and what it could be downstairs. The very next moment, we felt this atmosphere coming up the stairs. I watched Fran's head nod as he was falling asleep, but he still had his eyes open. He stopped talking and he just looked at the floor. I also fell silent as the feelings were beyond words. This whole experience probably only lasted a maximum of two minutes, but once the atmosphere had reached the top of the stairs, it came to the doorway of Fran's bedroom and stopped. We could see the condensation of our breath, and we were both shivering vigorously. I didn't want to look at the doorway, even though I knew it was there. And before I tried to turn my head, Fran said, It's Adam. It's okay. Fran was crying and holding his head. Although this seemed perfectly natural to me at the time, considering the way we were both feeling. I saw him do this many times after this incident, especially when he was experiencing the overpowering emotions of others, or when I was upset. He always seemed to feel these things very keenly, to pick up energy like a magnet, and to this day I believe he is extremely psychic. Frank continued, He's just popping in to say hello. He's having a great time in heaven with a couple of beers and some nice girls. I knew that this wasn't the case and that Fran was trying to defuse the situation to make me less scared by lying about what he was hearing. I also believe Fran was trying to deny that it was happening. As he was quite overwhelmed. I knew for a fact that what we were experiencing was a desperate cry for help rather than an innocent drop-in of an old friend. When I built up the courage, I looked over at the bedroom door and there was a dense gray mass swirling around the stair banister and reaching with tendrils into the bedroom. It felt like every ounce of oxygen and heat in the room had gravitated towards it. It was so suffocating in its intensity. I felt depressed and forced upon. There no choice in my own, and it felt like one feels during one of life's voluntary experiences like the process of 
giving birth. I have since learned that I am slightly empathic or have qualities of an empath, but I didn't know the word or meaning of it at the time. While I believe Fran could hear what Adam was communicating, I intuitively received my own picture at the time, which matched the communication that Fran had. This is what it was. Adam had been forced out of his body and didn't realize it at first. He wandered around for a while, disappearing and trying to swing at the tramps who tortured his body, but soon was being overwhelmed by the outpouring of grief and gossip about him by the community and found himself pulled this way and that to whoever was thinking about him at the time. Maybe the unified projected thoughts of myself and Fran must have created a particularly strong call for him to draw him to us. Worse still, I don't know quite how to describe it. Adam's spirit had been imposed upon by various unruly, perverse entities who had leached on him while he was alive because of his many misdemeanors, and now in death, it pounced on him and obscured his perception so much that he believed he was in hell and being punished for his sins. The truth, I believe, was that now he was in spirit. These bad spirits were trying to distract him from seeing the light. Therefore, it was either the bad spirits themselves or Adam's fear that filled the room at the time. It would have made me feel better if we had managed to convince Adam at this time that this was not actually his reality and that he had a choice. Better still, if by coming to us, if it had helped him to gain back control over the bad entities, but as the atmosphere dissipated, Fran and I said nothing to each other about it or what we thought had happened to him until two years later. Not a word. It's strange how the most significant life-changing moments do not always get discussed until years after they bear an influence. 500 people turned out at Adam's funeral. Amongst them, I heard rumors that a few others had experienced symptoms such as unrelenting cold night sweats or believed that they too had visits from the dense gray mass and felt an overwhelming sense of fear. Despite the high church Catholicism of the funeral and discussions about hell raised by the religious people who knew him, I never believed that Adam was damned. For a start, I don't believe in hell, and I also don't believe that there is a fixed destiny for anyone that is infinitely bad. To this day, I hope that he found his way, found a way to find happiness and peace on the other side. Want a commercial-free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories? Sign up at Apple Podcasts right now and try it for three days free. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories.